نحمده و نصلي على رسوله الكريم اما بعد I welcome all the viewers of Peace TV for this unique series of interviews that which we are having with our dear Sheikh Suleiman Salim from USA on the topic of trials and tribulations in the previous episode we learned that trials and tribulation it also has a positive side to it it increases the level of a believer in this worldly life as well as brings him closer to the creator in today's episode inshallah we would like to know from the sheikh that how did our aslaf our sahaba ikram the tabeen and the atba what struggles did they go through in their life and how did they overcome them what struggles did the sahaba have in their life and how did they overcome them what were the factors that helped them to overcome the difficulties of life and strive for the hereafter barakallahu fi bismillah alhamdulillah was salatu was salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala so we know that the struggles that we mentioned previously this fitna that people go through the hardships that people endure before i get to the companions i want to mention this very important point which is that people look at the struggle as a hardship because they don't understand the nature of this world they don't understand the purpose of this life and they don't look forward or towards the focus and purpose of the hereafter of paradise and so people who are so attached to this world and they don't have a meaning or a purpose in this life those are the people that will feel the most pain when they go through hardships but when your relationship with the creator is strong and you understand the nature of this world and the nature of these struggles then you look past them at the forgiveness of sins and the raising of one's ranks in the sight of the creator and in paradise on the day of judgment and so the companions of the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam the sahaba they were able to see that especially those who were close to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in faith and action and so we have many examples of the companions and often times in our day and age because of the many trials and tribulations because of the many fitan that are widespread around the world and the killing and oppression that is so widespread which is a sign of the day of resurrection and we will get to that later inshallah so people are looking at all these hardships and they're asking especially the believers they are asking how come why are we going through this and some people are even asking did the companions ever experience anything like this or is it more difficult in our day and age and so we really have to understand that the struggle for each individual is different and for each era for each day and age the struggle is different and so you can never really generalize and say everyone's struggle is more difficult than everyone from another generation rather some of the companions struggled more than anyone in our generation and our day and age and we have some people who went through so much fitna and hardship in our day and age that maybe some people at the time of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam they did not go through it now for the most part the companions the sahaba they went through a lot of fitna and we have many stories and examples that even the young children the young muslims know about these examples we have the example of bilal radiyallahu an one of the greatest people to walk this earth and who the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told us would be one of the people of paradise and so bilal radiyallahu an he was a slave he was a slave and so his master umayya this man took him out to the scorching heat of the desert imagine the scorching heat of the desert in arabia one of the hottest times of the day he takes him outside and he tells him that if you don't disbelieve in muhammad if you don't reject the messenger of god you're going to be punished until you die or disbelieve in him and so they put him on the ground and they put a boulder over him a huge rock over him and they continue to torture him until he would give it up but he never gave up through the struggle he continued to say ahadun ahad just one god one god now a question that is very important to bring up here did bilal have knowledge of fiqh of salah did he understand the rules of how to pray and fasting did he have a lot of knowledge was he a scholar definitely not it was only the aqida that which he had with him then exactly jazakallah khairan so bilal radiyallahu anhu he didn't have all this knowledge and information but he had the sincerity in believing in the oneness of the creator that is what the essence of islam is about submitting to the creator servitude to the creator and that is what will help us in this life and in the hereafter so bilal radiyallahu anhu he did not give up that belief ahad an ahad and he said later on that if he knew other names and attributes of god he would have also said them and they asked him how did you manage through the struggle how did you handle this pain this hardship and what did he say because they saw they started crying they saw the scars and the wounds on his stomach and on his back so they told him how did you get through this hardship and struggle bilal radiyallahu anhu said that when he was going through this hardship 
the hardship was great in quantity, it was severe. But the sweetness of faith in God, the sweetness of faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala overcame that. And so he no longer even focused on that struggle or pain. And that is what we do, that is what we aim for. This level of believing in God and hoping in God and loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the point where every struggle that comes our way, we put our full trust in Allah. And so we are able to handle this struggle. And this is only the struggle of Bilal radiallahu anhu. MashaAllah. So as our viewers can see, that we have examples from the lives of the Sahaba, both the men as well as the women folk. So Sheikh, you spoke about the struggles of some of the Sahaba. And we learn from the seerah of the Prophet wasallam, And you also mentioned that in the previous episode, that the ones who are tested the most are the Prophets of God. Can you mention some of the struggles that which the Prophet wasallam underwent during the years that which he spent in Makkah? Absolutely. And so the Prophet wasallam, we know if we study his seerah, we study his biography in depth, first of all, we'll become so attached to him. And this is a very important point to make that everyone, Muslim or non-Muslim, they should read the biography of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It will change a person's perspective about him. And so this man, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the greatest person to walk this earth, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he went through more hardships than we can imagine. And perhaps more hardships and stress and pain than we can imagine. And so some of those examples is when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was being persecuted by his own family members in Mecca. They were trying to persecute his own uncle. Imagine your own family members are trying to harm you. And they are telling the people, don't listen to this person. And all he's trying to do is to convey the message from God. But he knew, he knew that this message would require a lot of effort. And that you have to get through this hardship. If you want to convey the truth, you will have to go through hardship at one point or another. And if you want to follow the truth, you want to be a follower of the truth, you want to believe in the Creator, you have to prove it through actions. And those actions come about when a struggle comes your way. And so Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, at one point his uncle passed away and Hamza radiallahu anhu passed away. And he started going through all these struggles. And we know the example of when his wife Khadija passed away, the year of sorrow. So the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam lost his support. When Khadija passed away and his uncle passed away, he lost his support in that community. And they began to attack him more and to harass him more and to persecute him more. And so what did he do? At that low point, when he was going through the struggle, imagine all of his community is against him. What did he do next? So the Prophet ﷺ went to the city of Ta'if, as we know. And so the Prophet ﷺ went to Ta'if, and when he went there, he started calling the people to Islam. And what did they do? They did not just refuse him. Rather, they sent all the children, all the young people to go and attack him, to throw rocks at him, to harm him in any way possible. And he started bleeding, and he ran out. He ran out, and he was bleeding. This is the messenger of God. Look at how he was treated, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And so when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam left, he stood in a place where Jibreel alayhi wasallam came to him and said, this right here is the angel of the mountains, the angel of the mountains. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving them permission to ask you if you want these angel of these two mountains to crush the people of Mecca. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam is going through this struggle, this low point in life. What did he do? He said, no. Perhaps one day someone will come about who believes, someone who testifies la ilaha illallah from amongst them. Someone who does something good. He believed in humanity. He had so much, so much compassion, so much positive attitude and optimism. So when he was going through the struggle and he saw the people disbelieving, he still believed in them. He still saw the bright side. And this is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. MashaAllah, Shaykh. As individuals, the struggle that which the Sahaba underwent as well as you spoke about the struggles Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a community of the Sahaba together. We know from the seerah that there was a boycott of all of the believers as well as some of the unbelievers who belonged to the tribe of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So as a community, how did the Sahaba overcome the fitna, the trials and tribulations of this life? You are correct in, in mentioning the boycott. This is one of the biggest, this is perhaps one of the biggest points of hardships and struggles that the companions went through. So this boycott, the mushrikeen, the polytheists, what they did was that they instructed everyone to cut them off, to cut off the Muslims. In what way? In all business dealings. So nobody can give them any food or drinks or trade with them or buy and sell with them. Forbidden. The second thing is through social communication, through verbal communication, you were no longer allowed to interact with the Muslims. So imagine the Muslims, they were harassed and they were sent out and they were boycotted. To the point where some of the companions, they said, 
And this was for three years, this difficulty. This wasn't a few months or a few weeks. It was for three years. So some companions, when they went through this, they said, we had no food whatsoever because no one would sell us food and we could find no food. So we had no way of eating. They would eat the leaves on the ground, the random things they would find, the skin of the animals, the hide of the animals, because they had nothing with them. And yet the companions endured. And there were many factors that helped them and affected their relationship in their strength with Allah, in getting through these struggles. Jazakallahu khairan, Shaykh. We learned how did the Sahaba as individuals and as a community underwent the struggles of life. And inshallah, we will take a break now. And after the break, we will know some of the factors that led these Sahaba to overcome these trials and tribulations of the world. Until then, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Most countries of the world ban bullying. They fight it in their schools and universities. A lot of us are being bullied differently every single day. Some come up to us and say, do this. While others say, don't you dare. Some say this is halal. halal, halal. While others say, nope, this is haram. haram. Are, you confused? Are you confused? Do you feel lost? Join me in Umdat al-Ahkam, where with the grace of Allah, we will learn the proper knowledge from the Quran and from the Sunnah, which would help stop this kind of bullying. Join Asim al-Hakim in Umdatul Ahkam tomorrow at 10.30 p.m. and repeat telecast at 6.30 a.m. India on Peace TV. Thursdays provide. In Britain, we are facing one big problem that are you Muslim or British? The space to talk. In India, back home, they ask, are you a Muslim first or Indian first? And we Muslims should know how to reply, how to turn the tables over. The place to knock. Why Trinity cannot be regarded in that sense? Father, Son and Holy Spirit. The opportunity to ask. But even if we agree that what the Christians say, that he was crucified, so if Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, died for three days, who controlled the world? That means even God died? The freedom to unmask. So there are various ways which we can prove the argument yeah, to be wrong. Yeah. Let's meet Dr. Zakir every Thursday at 6.30 p.m. and repeat telecast at 9.30 a.m. India on Peace TV. A die dynamic. I challenge any human being to point out a single fundamental of Islam. In Youthful quest. Which is against humanity as a whole. Iconic, inspiring, encouraging. Don't judge Islam based on the followers. Farik Naik. Judge Islam based on the authentic sources. That's the Quran and, and, and the authentic Son of the world famous orator on Islam and comparative religion, Dr. Zakir Naik. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us an opportunity to do a proper job and to earn a proper reward. A star above par in Teens Star, next on Peace TV. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I welcome you after a break. We were discussing with Sheikh Suleiman Salim the trials that which the Sahaba underwent, and now we would like to know from the Sheikh. But what were the factors, Sheikh, that led these Sahaba to overcome the trials and tribulations of this world? Barakallah. So we know the Sahaba, they went through so many different struggles, so many different hardships. We know they went through this boycott, this severe boycott, and every companion went through a different hardship. And so these companions, after the boycott ended, you think that, okay, now there's ease. Now there's ease after difficulty. They went through another hardship. That was the hardship of the hijrah, the migration. Now the hijrah, if you really think about it, it was a very dangerous thing to do. Why? Because in that day and age, it meant that the companions, those who were migrating, it meant that if they wanted to migrate away from Mecca to Medina, they had to leave behind their family and their belongings. And in those days, the tribe and the family was a big thing. There was so much value in the tribe. And so they were leaving everything behind. 
And the hijrah itself, if you think about it, from a human perspective, it doesn't seem wise, logical. It seems like the hijrah, rather, it's more difficult than staying in Mecca. Because when they migrated, they might die along the way. The journey is very difficult from Mecca to Medina. In those days, there were no trains, there were no cars, there were no airplanes. So what did they do? They had to actually travel. They had to travel by foot and with camels and horses and mules. And so when they traveled, they were risking dying along the way. And they left their belongings behind. Furthermore, imagine traveling, taking on this journey, embarking on this journey, and knowing that once you reach Medina, there's nothing there for you. They weren't going to Medina to a five-star hotel. They weren't going to Medina to find that there was food ready and a job prepared for them, employment or anything along those lines. There is nothing for them. Rather, if anything, if you look at the history of Medina, economically it was weak and militarily it was weak. They had nothing in Medina. And so when the companions were going there, they had to trust in Allah. They had to trust in this mission. So they were going through hardship after hardship after hardship. And when the ease came and they were relieved and they were grateful for it, they would have to face another hardship. So the companions went through so much, especially the early companions. So they went to Medina, and now some of them, they don't have any jobs lined up. They don't have any money. They were homeless and jobless. And so the Prophet ﷺ tried to lessen and lighten this difficulty by pairing them up with some of the people and the inhabitants of Medina, some of the Ansar. So the Muhajireen were given friends and companions of the Ansar. Now, when they got to Medina, you think now that their difficulty is over, but now they have to establish a place to live. They have to establish a home and a job and a family. So the companions, they went through so many struggles. And the, the scholars say there are many factors that helped show us and it led us to understand how they got through these struggles. The first of these factors is their absolute belief in Allah, their unshakable faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if your faith in Allah is complete and you are firm in your faith in Allah, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help you get through your struggles. Because they believed in Allah, they also trusted Allah. And this is a huge part of understanding fitna and struggles and trials and tribulations. That when you go through that struggle, ask yourself. Ask yourself about your reaction. Do you trust Allah? Is your reaction the reaction of someone who trusts Allah? Or is your reaction a reaction of someone who does not trust the Creator? Someone who is weak in their faith, someone who cannot handle the decree of the Creator, the Qadr of Allah. So their unshakable faith was the number one factor. The fact that they believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is tawheed, that is the oneness in believing in Allah. That is what helped Bilal through his struggle. That is what helped Sumayya, that is what helped Umar al-Khattab, all of the companions. That is what helped them with their struggles. As they say that the faith can move mountains. Faith can move mountains, faith can shake mountains, it can help people. It can take you places you cannot begin to imagine. Now, the second factor that really helped the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the fact that they loved Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and loved the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, when we look at previous Prophets and Messengers, you see examples of many Messengers who came with this message from God and some people rejected them. And everyone treated these Messengers in a different way. Some people accepted them, they believed in them, they followed them. Some people, they were indifferent. So they didn't accept and they didn't reject. Rather, they didn't want to talk or be interacting with these messengers. So they didn't harm them, but they also didn't believe in them. And then there were some people who disliked. They hated these messengers and they tried to harm them. And this is what the companions went through and what the Prophet ﷺ went through. So the companions, when they believed in Allah and they loved Allah, they loved the one that he sent as a messenger. So they loved the true messenger of Allah ﷺ. And this love of the messenger, if you love Allah and love his messenger, you will sacrifice anything for them. You will sacrifice your life for them. And so the companions were able to do this because of their love of Allah and his messenger. And we ask ourselves this question. Oftentimes, some of the youth will say, if only we lived at the time of the Prophet Wasallam, we would be better believers. But you don't know. You don't know. Because if you're not a good believer now, how do you know you would have been a good believer then? If you're not strong in your faith right now, how do you know you would have been strong then? If you don't love the Prophet now, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, how do you know you would have loved him then? It's a very scary situation. And so the reality is if you love the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and you love Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, the one who created you, the merciful, then that love will be reflected through your actions. And those actions will show in every day of your life. The way you interact with others, the way you interact with your creator, the way you follow his message and his messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So one of the signs that you love Allah and his messenger is that you learn about them. 
You learn about Allah. You learn about the attributes of Allah. You learn about the gifts that Allah gave us. You learn about the hereafter that Allah created as a reward for some people and a punishment for others. And if you love the messenger, you will learn about the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. All of us can claim, every one of us Muslims can claim, I love the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because it is a requirement. But do we truly love the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? It is reflected through our actions more than our words. So for example, if someone does not know the Prophet, they don't bother to read about the Prophet. They don't even care to understand the seerah or the biography of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But they have the time to read about disbelievers or maybe celebrities that they look up to or maybe sports players or soccer players or anything else. They look up to all of these other people. They read so much about them because they love them. But they don't read about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So this will give us more of a reality and a reality that is harsh sometimes for some people. That do you truly love the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Are you following his sunnah? Are you following what he conveyed to you? Are you passing it on to other people? So this is the love the Sahaba had. And so this love helped them get through their struggles. Because when you are going through a hardship, you have to understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what you're going through. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa went through more than what you go through. And so if you love Allah and love his messenger, you will bear the hardship of this difficulty. You will go through it. And so they loved the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and they went through that difficulty by loving Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa Sallallahu alayhi wa And this is been wonderfully summarized in one of the verses of the glorious Quran in Surah Ali Imran, verse number 31. Qul, in kuntum tuhibbun allaha fattabi'uni yuhbibkum Allah. That if you claim to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you need to follow the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Follow his sunnah. We realize that it is not just a mere claim to love Allah and his messenger. And most of us, if I'm not wrong, Sheikh, they think that we are Muslims. And why are we facing this thing that which we are facing today? from all across, everyone's looking down upon us. Why this shame? But the answer lies in the very fact that we fail to implement the sunnah of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Shaykh, mashallah, you spoke about the factors. Are, are there any other factors besides the strong faith, the tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the love for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the true love for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? What other factors were there which helped the Sahaba to overcome the trials and tribulations. Absolutely. There were many other factors as well. And we can mention, inshallah ta'ala, at least three more factors that will help us, inshallah. Inshallah. So one of the factors that also helped the companions through this struggle is the fact that they had a sense of responsibility. And they didn't run away from the responsibility. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He brings a hardship your way, and when He tells you that He's testing you in this life, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that He created us for what? to test you. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing us in this life. So now once this test comes your way, what are we doing with that responsibility? Are we running away from our responsibilities back to the dunya? Are we running away back to our desires and to relief and to relaxation? So when the Sahaba went through these hardships and they went through these struggles, they understood the sense of responsibility and they understood that that responsibility would affect many other believers. Meaning they were helping convey the message of Islam even though they might have not realized the extent of it. Can you imagine Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, or Umar radiallahu anhu, or Talha radiallahu anhu, or any of the companions? Can you imagine if they knew how many people would be praising them later on? How many millions, if not billions of Muslims are mentioning their names and reading their biographies and understanding that they helped convey this message from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam? And so this sense of responsibility brings us to this point that we as believers, we as Muslims, are messengers of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So we have a sense of responsibility and we have to convey that message first by transforming us, by internalizing the message and then by acting upon the message and then by preaching it to others as well. And so we have a sense of responsibility and the companions understood that sense of responsibility and so this helped them in their struggles. Another of the factors that also helped the Sahaba through their struggles is that the Sahaba believed in the day of resurrection. They believed in the hereafter. And so when you believe in the day of judgment, and you believe that you will come back to your Lord and be asked about everything, you will be held to account for every major and minor deed, the good and the bad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ خَيْرًا يَرَى وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ شَرًا يَرَى Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Zalzalah, whoever then does an atom's weight, the smallest unit of measurement of good deeds, of a good action, will come to find it on the day of judgment. And whoever does it, it's a small amount that Adam's weight worth 
of an evil deed, a sin, will come to find it on the Day of Judgment. So when you believe in the Day of Resurrection, when you believe in paradise and hellfire, you believe in the reward and the punishment, then on that day, you can help yourself get through the struggles of this life. You can help yourself get through the hardships because you know there is a day of accountability. There is a day of hisab, standing one-on-one -on -one with the Creator, being questioned about everything that we went through in this life, all the hardships, all the blessings, how we use them for or against ourselves. And so this factor helped the companions through that as well. And the last factor that we want to mention, inshallah ta'ala, for today's episode is the factor regarding the belief in the Qur'an and the glad tidings of the Qur'an. So the companions, they had these glad tidings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throughout the Qur'an. The glad tidings of paradise and rewards and Jannah and the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so we go through these struggles, like the companions went through some struggles, and when we go through them, we remember these constants and these factors in their lives and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped them get through their struggles through these very factors. Jazakallahu khairan, Shaykh. Alhamdulillah, we learned the factors that which helped the Sahaba to overcome the trials and tribulations of this life. Inshallah, we would continue more on this, how the Sahaba overcame the struggles of the life. Inshallah, in the next episode. Until then, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.